Church, as we continue to worship, I'm going to invite you to take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22 this morning. Revelation 3, verses 14 through 22. We, this summer, are on a seven-stop tour through the seven churches that Jesus, in his glorious, resurrected, ascended state, spoke to directly. Seven churches in ancient Asia Minor, this modern-day Turkey now. Our last stop is the church at Laodicea. We who have ears to hear would hear the word that he would desire to speak to us. A uh, very significant conversation that happened uh, for me was when I was about 18 years old. It was the second semester of my freshman year. I was a student at Mississippi College, and I was taking an American Lit class with the head of the department, Dr. Gene Fant, who I had gotten to know a little bit through us attending the same church. You kind of sort of understand that my second semester of my freshman year, I, I was clear that God had called me to the ministry, but I still wasn't uh, really committed to what it meant to pursue Christ through academic discipline by any stretch of the imagination. So I was majoring in hanging out, minoring and getting by. You know, that's sort of where I was as an 18-year-old. And so I turned in a paper to Dr. Pham. He gave it back to me the next class period, along with other of my classmates. I remember vividly I made a 72 on it, but I think that was uh, really merciful. On it. it could have been worse. It was red ink just splattered all across that paper. I got up to leave the class, and as I was walking out, he said, Eldridge, follow me. I walked with him, and he said a lot to me, but the essence of Dr. Fant's words to me in that moment were two questions. One was, is it the best that you can do? The obvious answer to that was no. The second question was a more penetrating question, but he asked it. He said, do you, do you think this is honoring to the Lord? And the obvious answer to that was no. And that conversation, not, not really the questions, but in time, just that he took the time to pull me back, to speak into me, to give me in that moment what I really needed to receive. I, I didn't really want to receive it. And I remember being embarrassed in the moment. I remember uh, being in the moment taken aback by the directness of him talking to me. But, but in the end, I realized the gift that he gave me because he knew me and he cared enough to be confrontational in the best tough love way. And for that, I am now. And even then was grateful for. And I think all of us could look back upon our life and to say that we have all been beneficiaries from individuals, friends, family members, coaches, teachers, employers, co-workers who have known us and cared about us enough to be able to stop and to point out things that we might not see with our own eyes or things that we neglect in our own life. We're all prone to this and we're all recipients at times of the best of tough love and it can shape us and it can mold us in the best ways if we have ears to hear and to heed. You see, the question isn't, have you ever been on the receiving end of that? The, the more vital question is, is, is how do you react to words that are true, but the words that sting. You see, it's easy to be dismissive, isn't it? It's easy to immediately be defensive, isn't it? It's, it's easy to, to have a posture with our arms extended, pushing people away from us, especially the truer the words are to us. But we who desire to grow need to be people who are willing to receive tough words. Spoken in love, spoken in truth. And so here we have our Savior addressing a church that he loves and he knows dearly, the church at Laodicea. And we save now some of what can be, at first glance, the harshest words for the last church. But note that these are words not just for a church 2,000 years ago, but they're words that continue to speak if you and I, if we would have ears to hear. So this morning, hear the word of the Lord. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness. The beginning of God's creation, 
I know your works. You're neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich. I have prospered. And I need nothing, not realizing that you're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. As I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now to understand the setting of Laodicea, you have to understand the the wealth and self-sufficiency that this church had, the city had. It was a infamous city in the sense that an earthquake struck it in AD 60. And the self-sufficiency of this city and the richness and the wealth of the city was so much that they were able to say to the patronage of the Roman Empire, we do not need your help to rebuild. No one else could say that. They, they wanted a, a bit more autonomy from the Roman Empire. And so in their self-sufficiency and in their wealth, they were able to say, we don't need your help. There were two major industries in Laodicea that gave them this self-sufficiency. One was the textile industry. They were noted for this uh, a type of sheep that had this fine black wool that they would export around for fine clothing. They were noted for their medicinal advancements. They were close to these hot springs and there would be this special ointment, an eye ointment that they would use for eye disease 2,000 years ago. And so these two pairing industries gave this city, Laodicea, gave them a a sense of self-sufficiency and wealth. They had everything that they needed. Jesus is saying, in your sufficiency, you have become smug. And in your smugness, You need to hear and heed a word from me. And who could speak this? If the Roman emperor himself cannot bring them to to a dependency upon him, who could speak this but the king of kings and the Lord of lords who would look through their self-sufficiency and say in verse 15, I know your works. I, I know all that you celebrate. I know all that you have. I know all that you have your pride in here, but I'm here to tell you, you are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. Verse 16, so because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Five miles away from Laodicea is a city by the name of Hierapolis. Hierapolis was noted for their hot mineral springs. And so five miles away, they would receive this hot water, Laodicea with this aqueduct system here. And by the time the hot mineral springs that were used for this eye ointment would get to Laodicea, what would happen? Well, it would be cool, tepid, stale, stagnant water. It wasn't useful for the medicinal purposes that it could have five miles away. On the other end, they were nine miles away from Colossae. And they were noted for their cold, refreshing, drinking water. They would receive it there in Laodicea. And by the time it makes that nine-mile journey, guess what? It's tepid, stale, stagnant, not useful for the refreshing, cool taste to drink it here. Jesus is saying, you're like the water. You're, You're not hot. And you're not cold. And I'm going to spit you out. It's not how we hear this verse. We oftentimes hear this verse and utilize the images of hotness being hot is good. 
You're going to be on fire for Jesus. Coldness, coldness means that you don't follow Jesus. Coldness might mean that you're agnostic to him or you're an atheist and you've rejected him. Jesus isn't saying in this moment, I would rather you be on fire for me. Or actually, he's not saying, I would rather you not believe in me than to be lukewarm. Cold is good. Hot is good. What he's condemning is the tepid, stale, stagnant water being in between here. If he was utilizing other images, maybe you would see it a little bit better. Maybe he's talking about coffee here, and you're a coffee drinker, and maybe you like cold brew coffee, and you pull it right out of the refrigerator, and you drink it in that moment. What you wouldn't do was to take that cold brew coffee, let it sit on the counter for hours upon hours and upon hours, and say, hey, taste this. What would the recipient do? Spit it out. Or that freshly brewed hot coffee that you had early this morning that gets you going in the morning. What you wouldn't do is to take that hot, fresh coffee and let it sit out at warm uh, room temperature and become warm and tepid and stale. And hours later say, hey, here you go. It's disgusting, would it not be? If Jesus was using another image, he would say, you've lost your fizz. If we're talking about a Coca-Cola here, you've become flat. You've become stale. You've become stagnant. You have lost, Christians, your freshness in your faith. And now we know what he's talking about. Because there's not one of us who are followers of Christ that doesn't know what it is to lose our fervency, our freshness. You remember what it was to be saved by Christ and to have a desire to be in his word and to have a desire to be on your knees in prayer, have a freshness where things were new to you in the faith. And God was speaking to you through the stories of the word of God and you were this sponge and you just soaked it in. But what happens over time can happen just in Laodicea, can happen in your soul, can happen in mine. Where the coldness and the hotness, the the freshness of the faith becomes tepid, becomes tame. It becomes stale. It becomes stagnant. We become familiar with it. I remember vividly when my son, Jonathan, who's now a fifth grader, was maybe two years old, maybe a little younger than two. We would sit him in the high chair and we would oftentimes, because he has two older brothers, we would oftentimes try to entertain him. And the goal was to do what? To make him laugh. So his two older brothers would do something and would he laugh? Would he laugh? And I remember so vividly sitting there and watching Jonathan. They're doing their very best to entertain him. Their very best to make him laugh. And you know what he did? He yawned in their face. (laughs) You are boring me. How many of us yawn in the face of a holy, sovereign God. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. I surrender all. It doesn't take much imagination to know what it means to lose the freshness of our faith. It doesn't take much imagination to know what it means to lose the vibrancy of our faith and to be bored with the infinite insights of the word of God and become stale to following and serving him, become all too familiar with the things of God and handle it in such a way that it's just Uh, yesterday's news and we move on with other things that are more important and in this moment Jesus speaks to the church in Laodicea and he speaks to us because this is not what they were expecting verse 17 for you say I am rich I have prospered and I need nothing they think they've got it all together spiritually here not realizing Jesus says you're wretched pitiable poor blind and naked pitiable wretched Poor, blind. Notice how he just pours these images one after another here. They're believing the lie that their prosperity equals spiritual growth. 
That they're believing the lie that because they're doing well in life, that must be an indication of their spiritual health. But Jesus is saying, your, your retirement accounts are overflowing, but there's spiritual bankruptcy that is occurring in your life here. And I need to sit you down as the great physician and do a, a little bit of a diagnostic to you, but to give you the cure here. And the cure, verse 18, is interesting. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Do you see what Jesus is doing? I mean, he is speaking their language. I told you in the introduction, they had these medicinal advancements for this eye ointment. They had this textile industry here and he, he is channeling their own industry to show just how much they're doing in their own strength without him. He's saying, you're exporting all of this fine wool, but I see you and you're not clothed in my righteousness. You're, you're not clothed in a relationship with me. You're clothing yourself in your success. You're clothing yourself in your prosperity. You're clothing yourself in your doing, but you need me. You're, you're going around and you're showing people how they can see and be cured from an eye disease, but you're missing, you're missing because your eyes are not open to your spiritual condition before you. These Christians here, they're looking for their success in all the wrong places. They're looking for their identity in all the wrong places. I can't help but to say that without thinking of that old country music song. Do you remember Johnny Lee looking for love in all the wrong what places? Looking for love in too many what Oh, come on. Y'all know that song there. Looking for love in too many faces. Y'all seen the movie Urban Cowboy? Come on. I know you know what I'm talking about here. These Christians, they were looking for their security in all the wrong places. They're looking for their identity in all the wrong places. Instead of looking to Christ for their security, what were they doing? They were looking to their wealth for their security. Instead of looking to Christ for their success, you know what they were doing? They were looking to their surroundings for their identity. And Jesus says to them, apart from me, you can do nothing. That's the essence of this passage here. He is making one point to these believers that they must depend upon Jesus for everything. Not just their salvation, but their continued growth in him. They can't save themselves, but they can't grow apart from him. And these Christians, they're looking for joy in all the wrong places. They're looking for hope in all the wrong places. They're looking for their identity in all the wrong places. They have spiritual attention deficit disorder. This is what they're struggling with here. How many of you have seen the movie Up? It's a Pixar movie. It came out a few years ago. It's actually a beautiful movie. There's a dog in that movie that is, is one of the uh, you know, most enjoyable parts of the movie because every time this dog sees a squirrel, it's a squirrel, and it moves on, and it chases after, and it bolts. And this is how we are by our nature and by our choices. We suffer, as the church in Laodicea did, from spiritual attention deficit disorder. We, we chase after the things of this world. We've sung this and the great hymns of our faith. You know it. Uh, we are prone to wander. We all feel it. We're prone to leave the God that we love. This church is distracted. And the gifts of life have gotten in the way of their adoration and affection for the giver of the gifts. And do not think that that's not a temptation that is not before us almost 2,000 years later. Where the gifts become what we adore, become what we worship, become what has our affection. And ultimately, we fail to worship the giver of the gifts. Our heads and our hearts are prone to wander. And Jesus comes in verse 19 and he says, I've got a tough word for you, but this word is not a word that I tell you to, to beat you down. It's not a word that I'm telling you to pick on you in this moment. Notice the motivation, verse 19, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. 
the words that are tough, I will spit you out the well, actual uh, language and the emphasis of the Greek language here is I will, I will vomit you out of my mouth. I, I'm, re, I'm repulsed by you in this state. He, he says this because he loves them so much. And he says it to us because he loves us so much. We have so redefined love as only words that build up and lift. So, so the only way we can hear words and interpret them as loving words in our culture, so often, if only somebody is patting us on the back saying, you are amazing, you are perfect, there is nothing that you can possibly do that is wrong. Keep it up. And what do you in that moment? I feel loved. But, but it is not loving to ignore wrongs, is it? It is not love, uh, loving to, to, to only say what is positive and to forget to correct and to reprove. And our Savior loves us enough as he loved the church 2,000 years ago, enough to tell them hard things. And we need that in our life. You go to a physician and you have your annual checkup and she runs tests and he runs tests. You come back for a consultation. He sits you down. She sits you down and walks through all of your results. And the doctor says, hey, listen, your blood pressure is 190 over 120. Your LDL cholesterol level ratings, they're above 200. Your blood sugar levels, they're about 300 or above right there. No big deal. All is well. You're doing great. These are obviously bad readings. And the most loving thing that a physician can say to us in light of our physical state being these characteristics is to say one word, and that word is repent. Repent. Now, your GP is probably not going to use that word, but that is the essence of what she is saying. That's the essence of what he is saying. Hey, you're, you're traveling down a physical path here, and there are some unhealthy habits that are going to have to be left behind. And there's some healthy habits that you're going to have to pick up because where you are going on this trajectory is a physical dead-end road. And if that's true for you physically, how much more can that be true for us spiritually? And it was true 2,000 years ago for the church that Jesus loved enough to say the hard things. And so he says it to us too. You think you are healthy, but you are not. You think your wealth translates as enough. It's not. Your success is not enough. This moment, Jesus, as the great physician, has us and has them in the examining room. And he offers an invitation and some of the most beautiful images in all of Scripture. Verse 20, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. It's interesting how we in the church have heard this verse. It's tempting to look at this verse and, and say, here is Jesus knocking on the heart of the non-Christian. If the non-Christian would turn from the world and just... Hear and heed the knocks of the Savior and open the door to salvation. He will come in and save them. And of course, Jesus will save any sinner who turns to him. Of course, the essence of that is true, but it's not true from this passage. This passage is a knock on the heart of the Christian. This knock is an invitation to intimacy and communion with your Savior. I mean, you know this, but I just remind you, there, there was no higher intimacy 2,000 years ago than the intimacy of people sharing a meal together. So Jesus is outside of the house that he has built for the Christians in Laodicea. He stands outside of the door, the door of salvation that he has built. And the Christians are in there and they're, they're, they're doing their thing in this house. And here's Jesus outside of the door and he's he's knocking. It always amazes me when I look at this passage here. 
that to the Christian's heart, he is not going to break that door down of intimacy. He, he's not prying the lock. He is not forcing you to commune with him. Christian, you can ignore his knock. Many of you remember what it was like decades ago to have traveling salespersons come by your home, you had children at home, somebody is selling Encyclopedia Britannica's at the door, and they knock at the door, you look out the window, you see who it is, and you say to the kids, hush. Don't move. Don't go to the door. Rarely do we have people that are coming by, knocking on the door unannounced in our culture. We still have that to some extent. And you know what it is to be in your house and say, don't go to the door. Act as if no one is home here. And you know as a Christian that Jesus can knock on the door of your heart and call you to repentance call you to intimacy with him, call you to be on your knees in prayer, to act as if everything depends upon him and to know that everything depends upon him and you can ignore his knock. He loves you enough to not force intimacy with you. It's a choice that each and every one of us have every day where we deny ourselves, take up our cross daily, and follow him. And so here's Jesus knocking on the door of each Christian's heart. And we have to ask ourselves some questions here. We have to ask ourselves the questions, am I, am I living as if everything depends upon me? Am I going through my life as if my marriage depends solely upon me or the parenting depends solely upon me? My career depends solely upon me. Am I living a life as if true joy is found in climbing the next rung and only in the next rung of the ladder of success? Am I living a life saying that true joy is only found in the next workout program or or the next medicine that I'm going to take here and that's going to give me joy in this moment? Or are we saying that true peace is only found Found in the next purchase. And Jesus, if we have ears to hear, he's knocking. One of the most famous art depictions of this is painted by Holloman Hunt. About 170 years ago, mid 19th century, British painter Holloman Hunt displays this painting by the name of Jesus, the light of the world. His first exhibition was in London. A famous art critic runs to him saying, you must take it down. There's a grave mistake that you've made in this painting. He says, you have not painted the doorknob on the outside of the door. Hunt laughs. And he says to this art critic, what we need to hear is this is not a mistake at all. It's by design because the doorknob is on the inside and it can only be opened from within. And if we would have ears to hear, maybe you are on the inside. And Jesus is far from you, Christian. Your faith is stale and tepid. Your hunger for the way of God and the will of God is solely in the past tense. And today, Jesus stands at the door and he knocks. Would you, by repentance, open the door to a newfound intimacy with him as you walk with him daily? He stands at the door Let us pray.